That left me standing there with Adam Savage. I told him about the episode that made me a Mythbusters fan, and his excited reaction made me feel like a million bucks. Little did I know at that time that the Mythbusters crew would test some myths that would work so well to make Jesus' point for today. Several years ago, my son Nathan was really into an internet channel called Vsauce and its creator, Michael Stevens. Well, Wikipedia describes the channel as initially released video game related content until the popularity of his educational series, DOT, saw discussions of general interest become the focus of Vsauce, encompassing explanations of science, philosophy, culture, and illusion. As it turns out, Michael Stevens teamed up with Adam Savage of Mythbusters to take a science show on the road called Brain Candy Live. It was going to be in a town really close to us, and it was really close to Nathan's birthday. Awesome. So Nathan and I went, and we got to go and meet Adam and Michael after the show. It was a total bonus for me because I was a huge Mythbusters fan. When we got to the front of the meat line, Michael, the Vsauce guy, looked at Nathan's t-shirt, which had what is called the standard formula, or what's been called the formula of the universe, that neatly sums up our current understanding of fundamental particles and forces in the universe. It was really cool because Michael took Nathan aside and started asking him questions about the formula and Nathan's visit to the super collider. That left me standing there with Adam Savage. I told him about the episode that made me a Mythbusters fan, and his excited reaction made me feel like a million bucks. Little did I know at that time that the Mythbusters crew would test some myths that would work so well to make Jesus' point for today. In one myth, they questioned the wisdom of the statement, that will go over like a lead balloon. That statement was said in a derogatory fashion by other musicians toward Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, John Bonham, and John Paul Jones when they said they were going to form a band. So the four, the four took the comment in stride and named themselves Led Zeppelin and made history. So in this case, lead balloon, good. The Mythbusters actually made a lead balloon and floated it all around a warehouse. So it can be done. Or how about one of my favorite episodes after the uh, dropping an elevator episode and blowing up a cement truck episode, there was the, you can't polish up, well, let's just say manure. The meaning is that something inherently bad cannot be improved. Well, the Mythbusters were like, challenge accepted. They did some research and employed a Japanese hobby called uh, Hikaru Doradongo, which means shiny balls of mud, as the polishing technique they were going to use. They were absolutely successful, and it was amazing how lustrous the orbs turned out. So, myth busted, technically. During filming, the crew had to wear biohazard gear to manipulate and do the Doradongo. Their media could obviously contain E. coli, a bacteria, and other things that can cause some significant health problems and even death. Also, in a more recent question-answer internet segment, Adam confirmed that the orb still had an ostrich manure odor. Given these things, I think it begs the question, sure you can do it, but why would you want to? So in the gospel for today, Jesus 
has obviously been teaching about the resurrection from the dead, and the Sadducees are trying to make him look foolish, ignorant, or maybe even just stupid. Here's an interesting tidbit. The Pharisees believed in angels and the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. Well, some Sadducees confronted Jesus with the question. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married the woman. And so, in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. So in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? Well, Jesus absolutely rebuffs the question. And I think we need to understand that his response was an answer that fits the intent of the question. Jesus was not addressing the anxieties that we might have of seeing a beloved spouse that has died again, or family members, or friends again. Those are relationships that bring light and life to our lives. Here, Jesus is addressing the customs of the day and the graceless assumptions of this group. Women at that time were considered to be a means by which a man's future might be secured. His life project uh, his life projected vicariously and per per perpetuated through male offspring. The woman is totally disregarded. In order to carry on this first brother's bloodline, or to continue his legacy, or his life, so to speak, there needed to be a son. So the woman would be passed on to the next oldest brother all the way down the line. That's why widows with no son, family to return to, or a husband's family to step in, were outside of society and were in, in incredible danger. They couldn't own property, and they were dependent on the charity of others. Jesus' feet are firmly planted in the kingdom of God, not this world's way of doing things. He attacks their assumption. He attacks the premise that in the resurrection, God is simply going to take up a flawed pile of hurtless, merciless tradition and through Hikaru Dordango polish it. Remember, no matter how shiny it is, it's still ostrich manure. Tim Knopf Jr. commented that Jesus is not interested in the Sadducees' logical convulsions and assumption that whatever follows this world must be a shined-up version of what's here. Instead, he points to the resurrection from the dead as something entirely new, a new age, a new reality, a new identity as children of God and of the resurrection. Our assumptions, our casual cruelties, the things we hardly bother to notice, like a system that can pawn off a widow to seven brothers, have nothing in common with God's purpose. God is breaking in with mercy and justice, not just shining things up as they are. And God's intentions are far better than anything we can come up with. End quote. This is the God of which the prophet Isaiah said, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We are here, or we are listening in on this, All Saints Day, and we are thinking of those that have gone on before us. And I think many have deep questions and anxiety. What promise can I hold on to for my beloved ones who have died? As I grow older or grow near death, is there something I can expect, something I can hope for? Well, Jesus reminds us that God speaks to us in the present tense and is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
three that had long since died, but God speaks of as living. Jesus said, God, not of the dead, but of the living. We are called to a living faith. That living faith grows from our hope that is based on nothing less than the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The old song recognizes our anxiety. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the overwhelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. It's that imagery of an unyielding, unsinking rock in the midst of the terribleness that this world has to throw at us. Life and light in a sea of death and darkness. God's very character is that of love, mercy, grace, hope, and above all, life. And God in Christ came that we might have life and have it abundantly. So often we find ourselves clinging to the old, trying the same old things, expecting different results. We yearn for control and self-determination, and we plod our way through sinking sand, deserts and wildernesses. In the Bible, we find that God's people tend to wander out into the sand and wilderness quite frequently, and that there is where God meets them. That is where God meets us, always doing a new thing, making a way, standing with us in the storms, forgiving us, loving us, strengthening us, encouraging us, dying and rising for us so that we may work in God's kingdom in the here and now, breaking barriers and striving for the justice that brings the outcasts, the widows and the orphans out from the dark, unseen corners to which they have been relegated and walk with them in the light of hope, joy, and resurrection. Maybe it comes down to seeing ourselves as a lead balloon. All the old conventional wisdom says impossible and no until new thing. All the anxiety, the doubt, those that refuse to see you, the voices of those and that inner voice of ours that says, not you, and impossible. Those are myths. Myths that bind us to darkness and death. God is not about death, but life. It says in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. So in the spirit of Mythbusters, let's call those myths busted. Amen.